Hello there, my fellow future astronomers, and welcome back to another Warhammer 40k lore video. Today, unfortunately, is probably gonna be the last mark in our entry on the mysteries and interesting places of the Hadex Anomaly. Our no less than 8th episode on the topic. Previously, we described some obscure-ish demon worlds of the Anomaly, and today we're gonna describe a couple of other places which may or may not be corrupted yet. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The world of Vespasia is an agri-world, found in the Acheros salient of the Achilles Crusade in the Jericho Ridge. Due to its close proximity to the Hadex Anomaly, it has become a protectorate of the Stigmatus Chaos Cult. The Celebos War Zone has been deemed critical for the Acheros salient, and any attempts to expand beyond this battlefront have been put on hold until the situation in that zone stabilizes. For this reason, the Imperium has yet to begin a formal push to recover the world of Vespasia, even though the planet was scouted some time ago. In spite of that fact, the Achilles Crusade has a vested interest in establishing Vespasia as a compliant world as soon as the resources become available to do so. The planet is a verdant place, friendly to humanity's colonization, and home to a rich bounty that could greatly assist the Crusade's resource requirements. Much of the surface of the planet is actively used for agriculture, in addition to substantial aquaculture and the preponderance of wild game. Terran species that were introduced during the ancient Jericho Sector's Golden Age remain plentiful, although they have diverged from the source stock. Vespasia was never densely populated to begin with, and its time apart from the Imperium did not change that. Its proximity to the Hadex Anomaly, however, did have a significant effect. The natives have completely forsaken the Imperial Creed. The planet's vast agricultural resources are managed by slaves descended from imperial citizens. There is a ruling class of mutants holding the population in check. The forges of the Stigmatus provide the system's defenses and security, in exchange for a great tithe of the planet's harvest. The slaves live under the threat of starvation and constant degradation from their overlords. Because of the numerically superior underclass, the Ecclesiarchy has begun an unauthorized initiative to infiltrate the culture of the slaves. Thus, they hope to trigger a rebellion in the name of the God Emperor. The risk of arming a culture that had not yet pledged its allegiance to the Imperium, though, is substantial. So substantial, in fact, that the agents of the Ecclesiarchy did not attempt to get the approval of the Crusade's command. If the attempt fails, the arms and the training could be commandeered by the Stigmatus, or could create a local entrenched government that would need to be eliminated later. Word of such a failure could lead to a further breakdown between the factions making up the Crusade. As those agents are operating without the support of the Crusade, they had to make sacrifices that many might deem unacceptable. Very few of the natives have been subjected to any kind of genetic screening for mutation either. They are also operating without fleet elements, even though the Stigmatus does have a small fleet patrolling the system. The training provided to the slaves is based on Ecclesiarchy standards, rather than the more rigorous methods advocated by the Adeptus Munitorum. All these challenges and more may doom the effort to failure, particularly if the Stigmatus can be reallocated to deal with the uprising. There is minimal evidence of any Xenos on Vespasia, a few marble-like arches have been spotted in some of the deepest parts of the planet's wilderness, but nothing more than that. They do predate human colonization, though. Many believe that if the taint of chaos is removed from the planet, the system could be ripe for Imperial compliance. The second of today's places is a world called Tabius Rasa. Tabius Rasa is a name of both a star system in the Jericho Reach and the one habitable planet in it. It is a feral world, bearing the presence of humanity only with grave reluctance. Its vast oceans are high in phosphates and potassium salts, which require a lot of filtration prior to consumption. 
The humans of Tabias Rasa are technologically primitive, but they do have a stable society which seems free of warp taint. Many of their communities are built in the canyons and foothills of the mountains which can protect them from the wind. Others have moved to subterranean life entirely, escaping the weather completely. Over the millennia, they virtually lost all the advanced technology that their ancestors brought to the planet. By necessity, the survivors have developed agricultural techniques and water filtration systems with which they exploit the native resources. The planet's minerals are skewed away from metallic substances, and none of the surface plants are harvestable for hardwood. Bone, rock, and coral are used in place of metal. Subaquatic plants are harvested for dense reeds that the natives process into a variant of hardwood. They do lack the technology and the resources to manufacture synthetic materials. These combined limitations are almost certainly key for their primitive lifestyles. And between the limited resources and the difficult weather, some consider it a miracle that the colony has survived at all. However, there may be a darker reason for their survival. The natives are often accompanied by reptilian companions, which they call drakons. These xenos are a six-limbed reptilian race that grows up to a meter in length with a long tail. The colonists treat the drakons with great deference, often carrying them on their shoulders, and in some circles even treating them as peers. There are some among the Ordo Malleus that speculate that these reptilian aliens are actually some kind of demonic familiar. Strangely enough, there are few indications of conflict between the various city-states of the world, even though the planet is poor in resources. Reports have shown that some of the governments of these city-states even include the Drakons as citizens and peers. Imperial lore is only found among the population's ancient legends. The people also do not follow the imperial creed. Instead, religions can vary substantially from city-state to city-state. And in several instances, the mortal rulers of these cities are identified as living gods. The origin of these drakon is unclear. Warp contamination could have induced a metamorphosis in a native life form. But there are few indications of contamination among the human population. Alternatively, it could be that the drakons are not native to the planet at all. And if that is the case, they might be a colonizing effort on the planet too although the absence of any indication of spaceflight failed to support that theory. In any case, the close interaction between humanity and the Drakons will undoubtedly cause some problems when the Achilles Crusade finally arrives. The efforts of the Death Watch to study the humans and the Drakons led a Watch Captain Kulos and his squad to Tabius Rasa where they began analysis and even abducted several of the planet's humans and Xenos for questioning. All the humans were sedated and hypno-programmed to remove all the memories of the incident. The Drakons were eliminated, although their bodies were preserved for more analysis upon the return to a designated watch station. From there, Death Watch librarian Ishmael has had great success in probing the minds of the captured humans. His preliminary findings suggest that everyone encountered seemed to radiate an unusual amount of contentment. With the Xenos, however, he had less success. But he believes that they may be capable of reading and projecting emotions onto the humans. If this finding is supported, their empathy may be the reason why these humans are so peaceful. Such a degree of contentment could be dangerous for the Crusade's efforts within the system as well as dangerous for any humans under its control. Kulos believes that more analysis is necessary before any possible Xenos plot could be uncovered. Now, although this one is not technically a planet, it is still an interesting place with an interesting story. And namely, Watch Station CX-3119. This one was established to study the Hadex anomaly almost 8 centuries ago, in the early days of the 41st millennium. Due to reported fluctuations of the anomaly, the watch station was created to be mobile, that it could remain at the periphery of the warp rift even if it moved. In addition to the usual banks of Archaeotech sensors, it also sported powerful warp augers, 
to warn of any dangerous expansion of the anomaly which may place the structure in danger. Unfortunately, the devices were not good enough when the Hadex anomaly expanded by almost 50%, sucking the station into the warp and cutting it away from the Death Watch. At the time, the station was unmanned, and while the Imperium was loath to lose a valuable tool, it considered the station gone and classified it as destroyed. One can imagine the consternation, the shock and the curiosity of all in the Death Watch when Watch Station CX-3119 reappeared in 815M41. This reappearance provoked a great debate among Watch Fortress Ariac's Chamber of Vigilance and in the Inquisition. The new location was also many light years away from where it originally vanished, creating additional speculation on the nature of the anomaly. Many want to investigate the station and see what details the sensors of the station have recorded during all the time inside. While the matter is debated, an elaborate system of quarantine buoys had been set in place around the station, warning all vessels to stay away. While they continue arguing on how to proceed with the watch station, unknown to them, one man has already been inside. Master of the Forge Zeril discovered the station while traveling on board a Death Watch vessel to enact repairs on another watch station. His desire for knowledge of the unknown would lead him into the bowels of the station and whatever was lurking inside. Ever since, he did return to his post, and so far he has spoken to no one about finding the station or what awaited inside. What he saw there, well, we don't actually know, could possibly be the topic for a great novel. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these other places associated with the anomaly for today. I'm definitely sorry to be moving away from this topic, but honestly I'm surprised we managed to get 8 videos out of it to begin with. And for all of you heretics out there, there are still some episodes to be made in the Screaming Vortex. Not sure if I'll return there straight away, but I'm definitely going back soon. What are your thoughts on the places we described today? Did you know about any of them prior to this episode? Do share any questions or thoughts you may have on them in the comments below. If you found the episode informative and entertaining, Please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching to the end and have a healthy awesome day. The Emperor protects.